And so now when you say voice of reason during it, what makes you say that? Because I, I, I will respond to that based on what you say there. I'm genuinely so, curious. So on Twitter, everything gets retweeted. Everybody's paraphrasing. And you basically said, hey, guys, here's what's going on. Everybody's thinking this is a work. But this is the real story. I'm back here. It's not it's not a work. Not everything is a work. And when you said that, I pulled back a little bit and I was like, "Uh oh, this is maybe something I need to pay a little bit more attention to. Yeah. So I guess this is where my background in covering real sports and, and TV news stuff kicks in. Your job as a reporter is to observe and state what is happening with context when you're covering something live and you're providing live coverage. So when, when punk was going on this, I guess we can call it a rant, right? When he's going on this tangent, I felt it was very important to try and give as much context that I knew from my knowledge of punk situation with Scott Colton uh, to the audience who may or may not be actually watching the press conference live and simply state, with as much context as possible, what was being put forth out on that microphone. And I tried to observe body language during it as well. I think people that are in a room can pick up on body language and those small little idiosyncrasies that maybe you can't see over a stream or you can't read necessarily just through a tweet in and of itself. So that was kind of my approach in covering it live. And and I mentioned this today on Twitter that afterwards, it really took about 24 hours for it to sink into me that there was about 15 to 20 people there who firsthand saw what I think, and I'm sure both of you probably agree, will end up being a transformative night in the history of AEW, for better or for worse. And Andrew, so Andrew and I are sort of doing the same thing, right? Because I wasn't there. I left. I don't like the way the scrums are run. I don't like being a part of that. But um, Andrew was also watching it from the same sort of viewpoint as me. And so we were kind of texting back and forth. But Andrew, like w- as you're watching this, you're not there. You're telling me like, oh, man, the one show that I miss this, all this stuff happens. But like, what did, where did you yeah. what, what did you see from what you were seeing on Twitter and from the actual video? So I, um, I, I did not stay up to watch the scrum live. And I, the only reason why I realized what was going on is that I was getting a, a, an insane amount of text messages at like one o'clock in the morning or midnight, whatever, you know. Yeah, it was like almost like one o'clock when it went on. And I'm like, OK, something's going on. So I turned it on. And the, and the initial thing that I felt was like, oh, OK, he's building a great story for MJF. He's building a story to maybe do something with the elite, you know, uh, and, and like I'm not thinking that this man has lost his mind. You know, I'm not, I'm nowhere near there, but the longer I'm listening to this and, and, you know, John hit the nail on the head, the body language said a lot. Punk's body language. First of all, he started that thing off so aggressive with Nick Houseman, uh, for, yeah. for no reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, he came out yeah. swinging to Nick and I'm like, poor Nick. I'm like, he didn't really say anything. He was just like, uh, like couple, I think the, the, the conference, the, the AW feed was maybe like a minute early or a minute late so like we didn't get the initial question but like there was nothing there, there was no no Colt there Cabana. was no initial andrew there was no initial question it was simply an opening statement nick got called on and as nick was about to talk <laughs> punk started with an opening statement and and a few people did ask me that there was no opening question yeah. whatsoever and and give the so, relation just for people who don't know wh- what is the relation there why would punk go so offensive or so aggressive on on that is there I'm some sort of relationship sure. I th- I know Nick Houseman covered CM Punk's trial firsthand in Chicago because he was kind of boots on the ground there. But I and you know Cole Cabana was obviously involved in that trial, but I don't believe, uh, to my knowledge, there's no bad blood there. But I, I don't know the full context of that, so I don't want to speculate. Got it. Yeah, so I, I I you know w- watching it happen, you're you're kind of seeing like okay, you know what Th- this he's hot about and like after a while you're like okay he's really hot. Tony, I felt the worst for. Uh, very bad situation he was put in, and, and you know, at the to me, it was a moment of okay. So this guy has a second chance in wrestling, right? He, he could erase 
uh, the negativity that existed for him leaving the way he did for his fan base. Not not saying he shouldn't have left WWE or anything, right? Um, there's also a, a stigma with attitude, whatever. Everybody has their own reason to do everything. But so far in AEW, it's been kumbaya uh, for three years. And, you know, starting in January, things started to un unravel a little bit here. Cody leaves first. MJF dispute. Now CM Punk and Hangman. And now, now with the Elite. The fact that this blew into a brawl in the back or a melee, quote unquote, however you want to say it, <laughs> I, I uh, chairs were thrown, people are being bit, A Steel is biting people. Uh, this is insane to me, and I hope we are all wrong. This is Tony uh, Tony Khan showing he's this master creative <laughs> genius that's been able to fool everybody with, with this reality injected in, in professional wrestling in AEW. I really hope, I, I, I wish that is the case here because if it's not, there's multiple problems. One, you have EVPs that are, that are ready to get hot and argue. You have a world champion that's swinging at people uh, and he should be the locker room leader, right? He, that's the guy, that's your world champion. You have a owner that has lost control uh, for that night, at least, of, of his staff. This looks insane to me. Uh, I, you know, and by the way, a lot of these guys are millionaires on top of that, right? They're all in key positions. It's not like 1995 and they're, they're clawing for that, for that top spot. These are established names in professional wrestling and, and, and respected names. So this is insane to me, the whole process. You, you kind of hope that that it's like a nightmare and you wake up and it's it's, it's I'm not I'm not story. saying listen I'm not there's not a not an ounce of, of anything in me that's denying that this is a legitimate issue that yeah. they have I'm just I'm more hope I'm hoping that we are all wrong here because nobody wants to be right in this situation right this is a uh it, it never looks good listen they're trying to get a new contract on on Warner you know how does this look to them yeah and listen I would like to think I'm pretty perceptive as to if someone is working me or whatnot and at no point in that press conference did i ever feel like we were being worked on this punk stuff on the tag team title stuff with swerve and keith lee that was certainly like an in character kind of thing they were trying to do but uh, as far as this punk stuff certainly not and the craziest thing that i think has ever happened in a press conference that i've been in aside from a man who was literally on FaceTime with his family during a press conference after a Team USA <laughs> soccer game that I was in, uh, the security guard bursting through the door at full speed yeah. to go tent, which very much happened. And all of us looked at each other when we happened, but when it happened, but I, I don't think anyone put two and two together at that point that something in the locker room was going down. And when it started to seep in was, it was clear that it probably wasn't supposed to be Chris Jericho coming in for the scrum because there was this big random pause and they were trying to get Jericho via text. And I shot some texts off in that moment. And immediately I was told something's going down in the locker room. Something just went down. What, what and What's hysterical is what, what time was that? It would have been after like when, Tony, when... it would have been after Tony storm spoke. So probably, yeah, probably, I don't know, around, 12 45 local time maybe maybe a little before that so around like 1 30 east yeah around that around that i started getting messages from people at wwe asking me because they everybody thought i was there so there i'm getting messages like tell me you know tell me what's going on what's happening and i i didn't respond to anybody because it's 1 30 in the morning and i'm <laughs> i want to i want to stay in bed but it, it was it seems like, you know, everybody got wind of this around the same time, around like that 2 a.m. spot. Uh, was there, let me ask you this, uh, John. When you were there, did, how was Tony's reaction to this? Because at a point, Jericho said something to Tony, like letting him know that something something's happening. Can you repeat the first part of your question? You cut out there on me for a second. At what point, at like, ha at what point did Tony, uh, you know, like Tony's reaction to things? Like, at what point do you think he got wind of, you know, there's like a I brawl think, happening? I think he got wind that something was happening around when Jericho came up. And I think he, he may have said something to him at that juncture. Just, again, observing body language and their interactions and watching it back. It seems like that might have been what had happened. 
I was more surprised. There, there were a couple things I was surprised with. One, as Punk was going on this tangent here, I was very surprised that Tony did not step in and say something to cool him down and be a voice of reason to try to squash yeah. it where it was because I've been in press conferences in the past where I've seen managers or coaches or even PR officials. I'm surprised a PR official didn't hop in and be like, hey, let's let's take a breather here because when someone is hot about something and, and think of what – to give context to Punk too – Think of what he had just been through. He went through an extremely physical match in front of a very emotional crowd, his hometown crowd. His emotions are running high in the moment. I understand that. I get that. I was just very surprised, and I think that was part of the optic problem, right, that CM Punk is calling Hangman Page this top star at AEW, all these names, and Tony Khan is there nodding. And I don't think that Tony was doing that maliciously by any stretch of the imagination. I think it was just circumstantial and when you're in the moment it's always harder looking back on it to be like oh you should have done this you should have done that i'm not here to say what tony khan should have done or shouldn't have done i just know that there's no question in my mind that there is an optic issue there when the head of the company is sitting there right next to the man going on a tangent like this i don't think tony khan would ever endorse those words i don't think tony khan would endorse the actions of what happened afterwards but now he has to wrestle with that these were the optics what do you do now